right, James Fegan, White Sox beat reporter for The Athletic. How would you describe this White Sox managing search so far? Long. <laughs> uh, you know, well, let's say this. Uh, and I think that was one of the questions on like the survey we just ran was, um, is the process only matter if uh, it comes with the right guy? Mm-hmm. But I think something that was probably cited with the last few White Sox manager hires, with those Robin Ventura being someone they kind of recruited or Rick Renneria getting promoted directly at the end of the season or, um, you know, not interviewing a wide swath of candidates for Tony La Russa was like, they, they need to have a process. They need to have this, you know, thorough search. They need to extensively scan the league and, and talk to people and get a feeling of what they're lacking from other teams and people who have done it with other organizations. It seems like that's happening, right? Mm-hmm. It's just this extensive laundry list of uh, people they've interviewed that even has grown, you know, with publicly reported names today with, you know, John Heyman and Ed, you heard it too with the, the bench coach from the Yankees getting interviewed. Um, it, it seems like they're doing what people want them to do, what I think I would have written that they should do in terms of really just going through this process where they interview so many people, they interview, you know, the top assistants all, all across the league and, you know, the process bears out, um, you know, the best candidate to, to lead them going forward. Now, obviously until they announce who that hire is, we don't really know, you know, who won or, you know, how it, how it bubbled out or, you know, if, you know, if Southpaw gets named the manager after Southpaw's all this in the running interviews, Southpaw is in the running. Sorry to interrupt. Then, you. then maybe it, maybe it throws like a, a, a wrench and everything, <laughs> but it seems like this is the thorough process that everyone said it would be, yeah, but yeah. no one's really, no, you're, you're not going to start celebrating in the show. They've actually crossed the goal line. Um, Cause there's, there's always a chance to throw the ball away. Right. Well, if this search was a baseball game, what inning do you think we're in? I think we're in the ninth. Uh, I, I have a hard time imagining that we're going to go, uh, you know, see Rick Hahn at the GM meetings uh, a week from now. And he's going to be like ducking and dodging because he can't really confirm who, who talk about who the manager is. I, I can't imagine that's the scenario they want. I can't imagine this going days after the end of the world series and still being undecided. So I, I think it's been, you know, basically a solid month. It was basically a month ago when they're, talking about their their search process like you know the, the last show in town for manager speculation um you know i i, I have to imagine we're close to the finish it, we indications are that we're closer <laughs> close to the close to the end of this process than the start as rick might say it would have been fun if you would have said you know what i think we're in the second inning this is just getting <laughs> started uh let's go over what we know or think we know so john Heyman, you meant what we think we know <laughs> what's that Always what we think we know. <laughs> well, okay, so this is what I think I know. So John Heyman reported that the White Sox got permission to interview Yankees bench coach Carlos Mendoza. You mentioned it. Uh, I asked around today. I heard he was interviewed like a couple weeks ago. So this already happened <laughs> with Mendoza. Uh, and I believe he isn't sure he's getting the job. He I, He's on his way to like winter ball to manage in Venezuela. So it may not be him. What do you know about the rest of the candidates. Um, yeah, I, I, the indication I got was that also the interview had already happened and that, that, that wasn't like this new leader in the race or anything like that. That was just, you know, part of their process. Um, you know, a couple of weeks ago we were chasing whether the choice was a spotta and that was shot down. And then I think Scott Merck and MLB.com further just reported that he's straight up eliminated entirely. I think, um, you know, I've heard like the last week or so, there was a lot more chatter about, you know, maybe Philly's hitting coach, you know, Kevin Long having a track to the job. And maybe that's why it's kind of lengthening out a little bit is because he's kind of focused on the, the, the World Series, you know, trying to win it, you know, something that coaches tend to get involved in. But there's been a little bit of, you know, pushing back on that and, and saying maybe there's not the momentum. Um, who else is, you know, Every, every, obviously, Ozzie Gein was interviewed. Um, I think there's been some mention of, of Ron Washington. I think, 
I think uh, there was a little bit of like chatter about Quattraro before, you know, but obviously he's hired by the Royals now. And, you know, one of the first interviews that was reported uh, at the outset of the process was, was Pedro Grafol from the, from the Royals. Obviously the Royals are kind of reshaping their organization and, and uh, you know, probably not retaining their coaching staff anyway, but uh, you know, all indications that he's still involved in it. I, I think, you know, every, Every, every top assistant, every every candidate that people have been floating, it's been connected to the White Sox at some point. Uh, it, it seems like, but um, you know, I, I think Heyman sums it up pretty well this morning, where it says it's been kind of a mystery. Yeah, he also said Ozzy, Ron Washington, and Joe Espada have been mentioned, but none of those three are seen now as especially likely. Um, you want to go over this one by one? <laughs> sure. <laughs> So Ozzy interviewed last Monday. I'm told it was a long interview. My guess is if everyone was on board, he'd be hired by now. Has yeah, like what 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 would be the reason to still be I mean, I don't based on what I know, I don't know what the reason is they haven't done it already. And maybe they kind of have settled on it but are still waiting to announce until an off day. But yeah, I, I would think that if the momentum was there for that, that it'd be done, but you know. I, who knows? It could still be kind of an internal debate about what direction to go as well. I, there's obviously a lot of, I think it's probably unfortunate. There's baggage around the idea of hiring Ozzy that shouldn't, doesn't have anything to do with Ozzy's actual credentials. Cause you know, he's, you know, inarguably the most successful manager in franchise history. Um, he, you know, the things that the, his teams are good at, as far as like defense or you know offensive execution uh, or the fact that just you know kind of playing together and having being energetic, those are things that the team is lacking at the moment. So I think if it wasn't tied to this idea of them staying internal or uh, it not being it being ownership driven or, or not being you know the product of the search, but them just kind of going with what's worked before, you know he he would be like the, a candidate that I think would be very compelling and obviously. You know, he got pretty far at the San Diego Padres um, last year. And I think in general, um, you know, he should manage again. You know, I, I don't think the sport is in a good place where guys who have his level of feel for the game um, get tagged as not being analytical or, um, you know, don't get kind of opportunities to evolve with the game uh, the way that they probably can. Yeah. I do know some White Sox players would be all on board if Ozzy was to become their manager, but it's not their decision to make. Um, there's a thought out there. Well, you know, he's old school. We need a new school guy, like whether it was a Spada, you know, or a Grafal. But I mean, you look at who was in the uh, playoffs, the managers, you got Dusty Baker, you got Bob Melvin, uh, Buck Showalter. Would you call uh, Terry Francona old school? Maybe Scott service. You have, you have a lot of successful organizations that don't necessarily say that the manager needs to be this big font of analytics, that his job is to manage personalities you know, the reason he's employed is to kind of empower his feel for the game uh, in a lot of aspects. And, you know, we'll provide him the information. We'll provide him the research. We'll explain, uh, you know, the backing behind some of these statistically driven decisions. But we're not, you know, pulling a guy out of our analytics department and putting him in a uniform and putting him on the top step of the dugout. I, I think you have a lot of organizations that are having success with that kind of mixed culture in a way where I don't think someone who's just, I don't think whoever they hand out, hire for the next manager will be this, you know, someone without, you know, game experience or someone who's just, uh, you know, anecdotally driven in everything they do. I, 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 don't th- I think a lot of teams are, are kind of trying to find that balance. Yeah, I was wondering who was going to be. Bruce Bochy was my, like, favorite to start the offseason. Then I was like, well, Ron Washington after that, and then Ozzy. Uh, so Ron Washington, I, I guess he, he's 70. Is that a problem? He had a prior... Uh, issue, you know, uh, with substance abuse years ago, but he's been the uh, bench coach. Bench coach. Uh, bench coach. What's he? No, uh, third base coach. I think he's a third base. Third coach. base coach of the Braves. Um, but we, I haven't heard his name too much. So I'm what. They never said like it got like off the ground really strongly. That was yeah. someone they considered and that they would interview, but it wouldn't seem like it was something that like it never felt like it took the lead at any point in a, in a process there. It's felt like different people have taken the lead and at least the public perception. Uh, right. I want there every to, week. 
Yeah, there's a difference. There's uh, what what's what we think we know and what is actually happening. And I'm wondering how wide that gap actually is. Like I'm getting kernels of information here and there, but you know, that's, is this uh, a small piece to the pie or is it a large piece to the pie? I don't know. And eventually we're going to find out more information, but like, what do you think we know and how much of it do you think we have no idea what's really going on behind the scenes? Um, I mean, I think the white sex have been very stringent about not, <laughs> <laughs> you know, detailing their side of it. So I think everything as a result is, and I think, you know, they even, you know, I think Rick even said this at the time is that if the information, or at least the last manager search is that if the information is going to kind of get out, it's going to be from the candidate side or the other team side uh, that the candidates work for. Um, so I think a lot of instances we can get hear about a guy who's, you know, interviewed a week ago or, mm-hmm. We, we hear about an interview going well, um, but it doesn't necessarily inform us about the what the org is thinking about or what their process is at the moment. Um, because it's kind of all coming from maybe a little bit outside the decision room, uh, or at least relayed secondhand from it, I, I think it could be hard to stay up to date, even if like the kernel's information are, are rooted in truth or for when they first originated. So... Yeah, I, I think the gap can be significant. I think we're probably talking about the right names. I, I don't think they're going to hire somebody, uh, say, Thursday when there's an off day, and we haven't heard of this person ever in life. Uh, so can God, you imagine? Have to be prepared for that. <laughs> I, I, I put that at about a 20%. Um, I'm putting that at 20. <laughs> yeah, well, let's put that at 20%. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I think there's a little bit of gap in what the day to day progress is versus. Um, what we're hearing. Election day in Illinois is Tuesday, November 8th. Are you ready? NBC Chicago has everything you need to prepare to vote. Head to NBCChicago.com slash Illinois elections 2022 for a look at the top races on your ballot, like Illinois governor and secretary of state and the biggest issues up for vote, like the workers' rights amendment. There's also lots of info on how and where to cast your ballot. Whether you're voting early or election day, it's all at NBCChicago.com slash Illinois elections 2022. See you at the polls. Are you surprised, because I am, that Mike Schilt's name hasn't picked up any steam? I mean, this is a guy who, with the Cardinals, got a history, obviously, with Tony Russa. I'm not sure how much weight his voice is carrying with the decision of who is going to be his replacement. But I mean, first year as a full-time manager with the Cardinals, won the NL Central, went to the uh, NLCS, was the manager of the year, took the Cardinals to the wild card round in 2020, 2021, and then was shockingly fired after the 2021 season for, I guess it was called philosophical differences. But I would think like he'd be a guy who would Makes sense for the Sox, but I haven't heard his name whatsoever other than, I guess, Nightingale brought it up at the very, very, very beginning, and it's been crickets ever since. Yeah, it's been a little surprising since they, like I knew at, you know, at the start of the process that he'd be a guy that they would talk about that they've thought about in the past uh, in some capacity. So, yeah, the fact that it made no progress uh, would be surprising, but, you know, I'm a little surprised we're not talking about a spotter right now since, you know, they were interested in Hinch and, you know, he's somebody who worked closely with Hinch and I think AJ would, would probably have recommended to him if they uh, if they did wind up asking him about it. So, uh, there's very, Schultz is just one of uh, a, a handful of twists and turns that I thought was, you know, I, I probably would have included him on the list. I don't remember, I, God, I can't remember what I've written at this point. I, I probably did include him on an initial list of Hey, this is somebody we talked about because they've talked about experience, and this is someone they've they've talked about in the past. So it, it made sense, but yeah, it did, didn't seem to really materialize or go into a second or third week of, of speculation about it. All right, I want to get to a spot in a moment because you brought him up, but I first want to get to Kevin Long because I've got a quote. It's f- oh, three, six words from Rick Hahn from his post uh, mortem of the season. Quote: Fundamentally. We lost our offensive approach, right? So I felt like that was this kernel <laughs> that, that he gave to all of us. Like, this is going to be in, like, if I'm Rick Hahn and I'm in the driver's seat on this mission to find my manager, in my co-pilot seat is going to be that quote. Like, I'm looking for someone who's going to help me 
find this offensive approach. It doesn't have to be necessarily a hitting coach, but if there is a guy out there who's available who can fix an offense, Kevin Long would be that guy. Since 07, he's been the hitting coach for the Yankees, Mets, Nationals, Phillies. So that means he's he's coached A-Rod, Jeter, Posada, uh, Juan Soto, Michael Conforto, and others. But then it comes the question, okay, he's a hitting coach. He managed, I guess, in the minor leagues way, way, way back when. Is he ready to go to the big stage and manage this team? That's my question, and that's all I know about him. So what do you think about Kevin Long? I, I mean, he, he coached a couple of Yankees offenses that almost scored 1,000 runs. Uh, and I think there's an element of, well, he got great hitters, but that's kind of what you're looking at the White Sox, that you look at the list of names and you think this offense should be beastly, but there's a, there's a whole different thing from getting maybe baseline expectations from an offense and getting really great production from what should be great players. There's a difference between getting, you know, Jorge Posada to post no 850 OPS and getting a 950 OPS like he did out of him in, yeah. in 2007. He really kind of got the max outcomes from a lot of really talented players over the course of his career. And, you know, he came really close to taking over for the Mets and being their manager um, before they want, did this like kind of last second pivot to, to Mickey Calloway. And, you know, from what I've heard, he had a couple, you know, opportunities where it looked like he might manage two other teams uh, at points in his career. So it's it's definitely wouldn't be an unprecedented leap where everyone had just thought of Kevin Long as a hitting guru. And no team had ever, ever contemplated him as a manager before or, or he had never contemplated making that jump himself. Uh, I don't think it's quite in the same aspect of like suddenly making Rudy Law a manager or something like that. Um, I'd be I, all I, for that. I, <laughs> Where did you wait? Why did uh, you say Rudy Law? By the way, why did you just? Say I was just that? thinking somebody who's known as a hitting guru more than necessarily like an outfielder who, or what. I'm gonna look at Wikipedia and find out he did manage at some point. Probably no, I don't think he did. I, I know Rudy Law pretty well from his baseball playing career. Shoot, yeah, you know what? Why don't you check that? Because I don't want to be caught uh, completely wrong on Rudy Law's uh, Wikipedia page and his uh, coaching career. I don't think he coached. But you're gonna what am I, who am I thinking of? Uh, well, Rudy I'm Law, the wrong name. Yeah, because Rudy Law, like that's 1983 White Sox stole 77 bases. Rudy Law. I I have a, <laughs> the wrong Charlie Law is what I'm thinking. Oh, Charlie. Of. Oh, How okay. they became Law, Rudy Law in my head <laughs> is amazing. Yeah, I, I love that you said it because like that's like right in my wheelhouse with the White Sox when I was a kid. But uh, yeah, Charlie Law also in my wheelhouse. Like yeah, that was that was a hitting guru who was yeah. the, who was the so, hitting coach of that team. So there you go. I interrupted you, but go ahead. You interrupted me, you know, creating fan fiction about Rudy Law, but so it's fine. <laughs> but, but yeah, I, I think that that'd be the the overriding logic. Uh, you know, I don't feel like you see those hitting coach to manager transitions as often as, at least in recent years, as much as you would think. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's probably why the idea keeps a lot of momentum. And you know, the people who back Kevin Long say the things he does well as a hitting coach are relating to his players, are individualizing yeah. his approach to his players and uh, finding out what works for them. And obviously those sounds like skills that would work, that would translate uh, you know, to a manager. And he's someone who, in his hitting approach, you know, is very information-oriented, very analytical. He you know, famously kind of develops these whole packets in the, for all of his guys that he distributes about what works for them and what's worked from the past and what they can kind of maybe drill hone in on. So... Um, I, I think those skills obviously sound like something that would translate for him. And it, it's something that people across the industry say, yeah, he, he would be great um, if he got this opportunity one day that he's, he's been waiting for for a while. So I don't think that's, you know, out of, out of the blue or you know, it, I don't think it's some crazy only the White Sox would ever try this type of thing uh, at all. So I got your fan survey here, and I think this is going to further our discussion about the White Sox managing job. Uh, our thoughts, but I, I really like this because I'll be honest with you. I love to hear what White Sox fans are thinking. I don't always like to hear or read what they're tweeting <laughs> at me, but I do like, uh, well, unless it, unless it makes sense, but um, there are some very, very smart, passionate, and educated White Sox fans out there. So I want to hear what they have to say. So you had a great survey in The Athletic how the White Sox should make the decision on hiring their next manager. So first question that I have here is, what's the most important thing you're looking for in the White Sox manager search? And the top two, top two answers were 
searching outside the organization was number one, 33%. And then at 26%, nothing matters so long as they end up with the right person. <laughs> why, why are you laughing at that? Well, because it's kind of like a question at the end of the survey saying, is this is this question illegitimate and uh, pointless? <laughs> yeah, okay. But I, I found it, well, because I think what's interesting to me, 33% say go outside the organization. There is a feeling among Sox fans of like enough of these internal hires, and I get it. I totally get it. I mean, if you go back to – Rick has said it the last two times around. So, like, uh, they're not getting it from, like, the clear blue sky. No, I know. I know. And, I mean, the last internal hire, I mean, that was, like, deep internal hire. That was – yeah, you know, we're going to go – we're going to go way back 30 years and bring back Tony La Russa. So, I get it. I'm not surprised by that whatsoever. You? Uh, No, and – it's funny because I think nothing matters as long as you get the right guy is kind of the logic of like the last three White Sox managerial hires. Like, yeah, we didn't search, but we got literally like the most winningest manager alive of all time. So, yeah, here's Tony Russo. Who cares? We, who cares? We didn't do a bunch of interviews. Like, we got this, or we didn't search, but Rick Renneria relates well to this team, uh, and he knows everybody, and we think he could do it. So. Here we go. We didn't search, but Robin Ventura has got all these leadership qualities that we all saw as a player. So here you go. Like they, they follow that logic themselves. Well, it sounds like this is a more extensive search and we'll see it what it comes up with. So then I want to get to Espada because this is a long uh, question that you asked, but I, I like how you phrased it. This is what was in the survey. Conceding how little we know about how these <laughs> managers will work out, which of the confirmed and reported interview subjects, vaguely rumored possibilities, and frequent podcast topics would be the best option? Now, you forgot to put long in here, as you said. You want to explain why you didn't put long in here for the uh, options? Uh, I was tired, and I was doing it in between errands, and I forgot. Okay. All right. You're human. You make mistakes, as do I. So. Also, I feel like... I wrote that, like, I want to say the Saturday before it published, and I feel like I got, like, information like, hey, long might be a possibility here, like, that Monday. I feel like things kicked up a little. Like, obviously, I, I think uh, Mark Feinstein with uh, MLB.com had probably reported that he was possibility earlier, but it seemed like that became a, that became the theme of the week on, on in White Sox circles uh, right after I'd written it. So, right. yeah. Well, this is what really surprised me. I shouldn't say really surprised me, but definitely surprised me that Joe Espada, of all the people, like how many people uh, responded to your survey? Just so we have an idea, roughly. We ran it for like less than two days and we got like around 1,200. Okay, that's a big number. That's a big number. So 56% of Sox fans said Joe Espada. Ozzy was next at 12.8%. I mean, that is a massive gap. And then Ron Washington at eight. So there was definitely a thirst amongst Sox fans. And I would, I'd like to say that the White Sox fans, and you could you know, confirm this to me if you think this the same way, the White Sox fans who subscribe to The Athletic are really, for the most part, pretty dialed in White Sox fans. Would you agree? Uh, yeah, I think there's a level of obsessiveness that requires a. We did that T-Mobile production where everyone got it for free for a year, but I, I think there's a level of obsessiveness to where you think this is a good idea of what to do with your money. Uh, that is the cutoff that he, to, to subscribe to the Athletic. <laughs> I highly recommend everybody subscribe to the Athletic, and as, so you can read James Feigen and everyone else because I'm a, such a fan of what you guys do. Um, but so a spot of 56 percent. I mean, that showed me a thirst amongst at least your readers who just want him and wanted him. And sounds like he's not even going to be a, a part of it. Uh, what, what, was, what do you think about his candidacy? And should he should he, in your opinion, be the guy, even though it probably isn't going to happen? I mean, I've heard good things about him, but like there's a lot of guys who there's a lot of, you know, qualified assistants who've been working for years to do it like. I think that that number that Ozzy got is more specifically about him and what people know about him because fans know him a lot better. Ah. I think Espada is more this concept of this is the top assistant for the best team in the league and we want to be outside the organization and Houston does analytics, we want analytics. I think it's a lot more about these concepts that people want that they have 
attached to him. I mean, I've heard good things that's, that's not to drag him down or say that he's not, you know, couldn't bring these things to the table. But like, I think he's not as well known as. You know, we don't know how he'll be as a manager. We don't know how anyone will be as a manager. Like, I, I think I wrote this in a survey that, heck, 2018 Rick Renneria wasn't that good of a preview of 2020 Rick Renneria. Like, the job is so different year to year. Um, you know, it, it's always a little bit of projection of how it works. Like, I, I, I don't know what 2023 Ozzy Gino would be compared to 20, 2005 Ozzy Gino would be. I imagine he's changed a great deal and it would look a lot different than, than how it did because it has to at some degree. So I, I think that is a lot about what people want in a manager search or what people want the organization to move towards. And it kind of got tied up in this one guy to a very large degree, uh, more than we can really know, you know, what, how exactly Joe Espada would manage the, the 2023 Chicago White Sox. Yeah, in a way, he feels like the backup quarterback everyone's longing to see going into the game. But with Ozzy, I just feel like he'll walk into that room and he will command respect. Now, we said that about Tony right. La Russa, and you know, I'm not saying they didn't respect him, but uh, I do feel like Ozzy's voice will carry a lot more weight, and I think that um, they, they need someone to show them the way, um, and not just in a resume, right? In, their, in his words, in his actions, and his charisma, whatever it might be, and his uh, respect level, but... That just, and not- I, I, I think that's a really salient point because something, especially when uh, Tony first got hired, or in, in the first couple of months, it seemed a little bit of a, you know, kind of blissful uh, new marriage type of thing. Was Tony's going to make decisions and he's going to let the clubhouse kind of manage themselves? It was something a lot of players said as something like, you know, they felt pretty good about that. They that liked that. Mis- kind that of was freedom. a mistake. And I think this season, this past season, showed. Maybe this isn't the group to really do that with. Maybe that's not the approach that's going to work with this year after year. Maybe we, they need a bit of a, a you know a stronger hand. So yeah, I, I think that that there's a lot of salience to looking to someone who's going to bring that sort of presence. That this is, needs to be a bit more hands-on of a job than maybe we thought uh, after 2020 when it seemed like this was a you know team that was just going to be good every year, uh, no sweat. And I don't know Joe Espada. And I feel a little tad uncomfortable just bringing this up on a podcast, but I'll just take you, give you my first impressions of him. I saw him get interviewed on MLB Network, and I'm just going off an interview. And I'm thinking, he seems like a bright guy, uh, uh, very just like clear-headed, knows the game, but is he what, th- is he what this team needs right now? And I, my impression of just watching an interview was like, I don't know. And I was a little skeptical just just watching that. And this is a first impression I'm giving. But when you look at all the teams that have interviewed Espada, Mets, A's, Cubs, Giants, Angels, Blue Jays, Rangers, and now White Sox, and he hasn't gotten a job yet, maybe there is something behind the curtain that shows, you know what, he might be a good manager for this team, but so far hasn't found the right team for him to manage and I just feel like maybe this White Sox team isn't right for him, even though on paper he seems like that's the guy. But I don't know if it's a match for the White Sox. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, there could be. I mean, I, I didn't even watch this interview that you're referring to. But, yeah, I, I think there's a fit element um, that goes beyond just it's not like, uh, you know, playing a video game and the manager with the highest rating, you just hire him and then your team becomes good. It, it, there's a There's a big personality and organizational fit element to it that, that it has to be considered. And a lot of it feels like alchemy at the time, because if, if you had told me, especially with like, you know, how much they added veterans, I certainly wrote at the time when people were saying like, Hey, Tony's hands off and he lets this group kind of manage itself. It seems like, man, this is going to work. All right. Sounds good. He's not going to be this overbearing presence that everyone's worried about where he's, you know, talking to everybody about uh, you know how it was in, in 1979 and kind of projecting these, these things on them and how much we were concerned that, that was going to be the case after the whole Yermin Mercedes situation. Instead, we're sitting here uh, <laughs> at the end of 2022 wondering, like, man, I wish Tony had gone and yelled at everybody more often. That seemed like the big thing that worked. 
That is something that I have thought and actually said many, many times. I loved when Tony said, hey, I, I got to fit in with these guys. I'm like, that's a great idea. And then as I watched 2022 play out, I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. Don't fit in. You got to lay down the law. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, we're, we're spending September being like, thank God Miguel finally just aired everybody out. Yeah. Like, Who knows? That, that's where we're going to be by that point. It's a long baseball season with many twists and turns. Uh, a manager needs, here's what a manager needs. He needs a big toolbox. A lot of tools in there to prepare you or to, just so you have in your ability, whenever this happens, that happens, this happens. Oh, I got this tool. I got that tool. I got this tool. I got that tool. So I'm not sure Tony had the full toolbox that, you know, or at least wasn't willing to use the full toolbox when they needed it. That's just my impression. All right. Back to your survey. Uh, and, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, another part of it, like a manager can be the right guy for a team for a certain amount of time. And then it ends. And yes. It's not necessarily like this big, you know, uh, the hammer's not working demer- anymore. Demerit. <laughs> right. Uh, all right. So you asked, what is the most important quality for the White Sox next manager to have? Uh, top three. Number one, amongst fans, 33% experience with well-run organizations. Next, teaching, emphasizing, fundamentally sound play got 25%. And then communication ability with a diverse group that got twenty four percent. I'm guessing they're uh, you put that in there because this is a diverse group, uh, a lot of Latin players, white players. So maybe that was you know what you were thinking. But uh, yeah, I was trying to like put it politically, and then I had like people in the comments like they need someone who can speak Spanish. I was like, all right, you're and I don't you're making I don't, you're making the uh, you know subtext con- uh, context, I guess now. Yeah, so I that's what I thought. That's what I thought originally. When I say originally, a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, four years ago. I think it's more nuanced than that. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, they need someone who speaks Spanish. When Renteria came in, he was speaking Spanish. I'm like, this is amazing. This is great. And then I look at the playoff managers for this year. And I don't think any of these guys speak Spanish. Or if they do, it's got to be on a limited basis. Baker, Melvin, Boone, Showalter, Francona, Service, Thompson, I think you need to have someone in this is my my opinion. You need to have someone on your coaching staff that can speak Spanish and his voice carries some weight. It doesn't necessarily have to be the manager. Now every team is you know the dynamic is different. There might be more Latins or less Latins, but I don't feel like you have to have someone who speaks Spanish. I'd like to see more Latino managers in baseball period, but it shouldn't just be like, well, because he speaks Spanish he gets the job. So that's that's where I stand. What do you think? It'd, it'd be very patronizing to us to just assume, oh, these two guys speak Spanish, they'll get along. Like uh, that's, <laughs> that's, that's kind of what I'm getting work. at. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think it's a, a level of verbatability and uh, you know sense of how people work and uh, you know ability to connect and motivate people that goes beyond just like, well, if he's bilingual, like it, it's, it's a very simplistic thing that people latch onto. Obviously, it's helpful. Obviously, you know. I, I, it, my my 281 day Duolingo streak has not gotten me there yet, but it, obviously it'd be good for everyone to be you know a bilingual, and be able to communicate with other uh, on their own terms. But it, uh, it's not like this magic key uh, that makes everything right. You know, Tony spoke Spanish. Yes, yes. Uh, your next question is: This is really funny. It's not funny. It's just more revealing. What is your greatest fear for this hire? Number one, an insular hire from within the White Sox uniforce. 37% back again. There's just not an appetite for, you know, and, and that's Ozzy, right? I mean, it's not going to be Miguel Cairo. My apologies to Miguel Cairo, but I think that that is just a reflection of, we want something completely outside of White Sox baseball, White Sox universe. Tony Gill is our uh, editor here. He's nodding his head. So like, I, you know, it's, I, I see it, I feel it and I get it. And even though, even though I would love to see Ozzy Guillen be the manager of this team, um, which is also tied with me saying I would love for him to not be the manager on this team so he would stay with me at NBC. Uh, right. Uh, I am I am willing to look past this whole insular hire thing because if there's one exception to the rule, one exception to me, it's Ozzy, but that's just me. I mean, it's not like he's been just working as a special assistant either. He's managed the Marlins and he's managing Winter Lakes and you know he's talks to people around the game. So I, I think maybe he is 
insularity is still played up. It's not like he's just been managing a triple A team for like the last 10 years or something. It doesn't have outside perspectives, but yeah, I think especially watching last year's team, there's a sense of like, there's this talent, but there's something missing and we need to like, it's, it's, it needs to be, we need to find someone from outside the group who can kind of look at this and figure out what they're not doing, what they're not executing. So I, I think that's a very, uh, something that White Sox fans feel very deeply existentially that there's, there's some sort of wisdom, there's some sort of spark, there's some sort of way of doing things that currently is not present in the organization and need to go out and find in some way. And yeah. I, I think that's reflected there. And I think that Ozzy doing the postgame shows, this was just by design, not, not by design, this is just how it happened organically. In some way, I feel like he was interviewing for the job without interviewing for the job because the White Sox would lose these games. And what happens next? Oh, here comes Ozzy talking about what happened and what went wrong. And yeah, why didn't they win that game? Exactly. And then he gives the reason. And they're like, well, this seems easy enough, right? This- right. And that's what they're doing in these job interviews. Okay, Espada, uh, we lost 81 games last year. How do you fix it? Well, Ozzy was doing that all year on television. So, in a way, there is <laughs> some of that that's true. Uh, I like the idea that like the interviews are just like them watching like some July loss to the Guardians and be like, what happened here? <laughs> Fix this. Fix this. How would you? you know, I, that's what I would do. I don't. God, Ahmad Rosario is running around the bases like a crazy. But how do we stop him? Uh, how do you stop this? Uh, get better defenders and uh, and cut, trying to get more speed on your team so you can do it yourself. I don't know. Uh, rest of the survey uh, for this question: uh, AJ Przinsky got two point nine percent. He's not a candidate. Everybody, as far as I can tell, um, as of a few days ago, he was not a candidate. Unless something's changed. Uh, Scott Merkin. This is breaking news here. I think I need to like take a pause for a second here as we... Uh, uh, I want to get your undivided attention, everybody. Scott Merkin, White Sox beat writer for MLB.com. I went to the same high school as him, home at Flossmoor High School. He got 2.1%. More than Pedro Grafol and more than Hall of Famer Jim Tomey. Um how shocked for you to see these results? And do you think this means Scott Merkin is headed to the Hall of Fame? Uh, it's a big testament to the value of getting your name on the ballot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, we should probably yeah, run yeah. some sort of election study of like what's like the nadir or what's the average of just like if the name is on the ballot, people will vote some sliver of the vote, like the voting block will vote for it. Yeah, because if you put if you put a you dead just, person on the ballot, that person might have gotten more votes than Merkin. Right. We just put like Elmo on the ballot, like uh, you know, he would have drawn something. You probably would outfold me at least. I got three write-ins. Oh, the so one was voted for, for president, so I don't know if that maybe that's a different role. President of the White Sox, or president of the United uh, States. President of a local Dairy Queen. I think. Okay, okay, you are. Uh... Well, you're, you're definitely, they, you're executive material. That's what this person said. Uh, but and then six point five percent said other. Which leads me to believe, okay, is there any mystery candidate? Um, we kind of touched on it already that I, I think there's like a 20% chance that there is just because there's just some stuff we may not know. But uh, Pedro Grof, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his name right. Is it Grofol? I've been going on Grofol. Um, okay. I watched a little bit of YouTube. <laughs> But yeah, this, is, this it, is what I do too. When I see a name that I don't know how to pronounce, I will go to YouTube and I'll find interview. I'll find anything because I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Um, he just seems like if you go off of what Rick is looking for, does he check a lot of these boxes off? And I'm, I don't think he does, right? Um, well, the winning organizations part, uh, there's there's an X for because, well, yes, there is and isn't. Because obviously his career with the Royals, started in 2013 okay which is the start of that three-year run for the 13 i think was one of the first year they had were over 500 the next two years they win the pennant so he's part of that the last six years the royals um have been all losing seasons and they just lost 97 games and it was kind of a you know the type of season that led to a lot of heads rolling they you know gotten rid of their president of baseball operations who won a world series with them dayton moore they fired mike Matheny. they fired cal Heldred, the pitching coach you know i they just hired a new manager and who knows if, you know, he would be retained, retained, uh, you know, uh, going forward. So it's, 
it's it's an odd time for them to be the feeder team for managerial candidates for other organizations. But other than that, you know, I think his carrying traits that have been kind of lauded throughout his career are, you know, communication, relating to players, um, very diligent in preparation, uh, working at clubhouse well. Um, so that's sort of like communication skills and relationship building uh, and I guess inspiring and motivating guys. It fulfills that, but probably isn't like who you think of, of the top assistants of the top organizations and the guys who have been, he's been, you know, interviewing, he's been a candidate both for the Royals and for a couple teams over the last couple of years and really kind of compiling these interviews over time. Um, but maybe not, you know, who do you talk about when you, you know, the day after Tony stepped down of who are the, who are five or who are 10 candidates? You probably don't list it. No, he was off the radar for most of us. Uh, and finally, what is your biggest hope for this hire? This is one of your questions. I didn't use all the questions in the survey. They're all great, but uh, for the podcast, I think she was like four or five. What is your biggest hope for this hire? Uh, 37% of White Sox fans said someone who can enforce the fundamentals. That's Ozzy Guillen. That's Ron Washington, right? Those two. And then, I so- mean, I think. I think you, Ron Washington's candidacy with White Sox fans is probably built just off those videos of him doing infield drills uh, with Ozzy Alves and then being like, come do that here. Uh, the White Sox, I feel. Yeah. And then someone who can bring, and these are your, your words, bring the fire and the passion. Passion spelled P A S S H U N got 22%. What was that all about? <laughs> Well, I said like, you know, I, I think the longer form version of the question on the actual survey was about like motivate and, you know, bring energy. And, but yeah, it, it's people thought that this team lacked a spark last yes, year. They, they did. thought this was, know, this, this was I, the I Johnny, that was something that was said a lot. This was the Johnny Cueto answer. Where's the fire? Right. Yeah. I like it. So we, 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 we make fun of it because it's a very simple, you know, kind of meatball thread, but. When it's not there, you know, it's an issue. Yes, and it was missing. It's true. It's true. Um, you want to make a prediction as to who you think will be named manager of the White Sox? Oh, boy. So <laughs> I have to preface it with every week, for the last couple of weeks, has been here's a guy we're hearing – is going to like at least my life here's a guy here's a tip that this he might be in line to do this he's the top candidate chasing it and then the week ending with nah (laughs) or a straight denial or uh pushing back on it or some sort it just it's felt like chasing my tail to some degree so whatever i'm saying right now could just be the new thing i'm chasing this week that it's just not going to materialize, and I'm simply on it because I've chased three other options and it's gone nowhere. Um, so I, I, I want to just just encase myself in salt uh, rather than add a single grain, if possible. But someone who is interviewed was a candidate to start and has not been eliminated at any point um, is Grafal. So. Right now, my indications are he's still in it. So if you're not out of it, you haven't been like officially eliminated or uh, kind of deny that there was, there was anything cooking there. I think that kind of makes you stand out a little bit from the class at this point. So I, yeah, it would be off the radar. Yeah, it'd be a surprise. Yeah, they could just name Elmo or Scott Merkin or somebody, <laughs> somebody if assistant that I never heard of um, or somebody who's just the greatest Dominican Winter League manager of all time, and I haven't heard of before. Uh, but I, I, I think by process elimination, I think, I, I think he's still in. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with Grafal. Yeah, it's like the NCAA tournament. He has not been eliminated yet. He's survived still, in advance, baby. <laughs> yes, he's he has survived and advanced. He is still in there. Uh, so here's what I'm going for. This is my dream scenario. Dream scenario that they make. Because he hasn't been eliminated yet. He's still in there. Hasn't been told he's got the job, as far as I can tell, and have been told he has not been told he's not getting the job. It's that Ozzie Guillen is the manager. 
And here's let me. I want to say this about Ozzy. From what I can tell, Ozzy doesn't want to have this job for five years. He like he looks at this team, wants to if it's fix this team, wants to win with this team. He's a two year, three year guy. Then you bring Kevin Long. You make him the hitting coach with a promise of you then become the manager when Ozzy leaves. So it's kind of a prediction, a dream, a hope. That's where I'm at. How do you pry, how do you formalize that? Because to get permission from the Phillies to interview Kevin Long, traditionally you have to be offering a higher position, right? So do you formalize the fact that it's a succession plan somehow? I don't know, do you, do you, can you do that in contracts? Uh, Make him the assistant coach, it's, it's assistant one, manager. Or, yeah, yeah. Some sort of assistant manager or some sort of a... You, you make it very, uh, very clear. Now, I'm also, like, saying this, I mean, would Ozzy want that? I don't know. But, you know, I'm making it very clear. I'm getting two managers for not the price of one, but I'm basically, like, setting up this team to win now and in the future with these two, uh, you know, very well-respected uh, men. That's what I'm going for. Now, is this going to happen? I have no idea. Um, but in terms of like prediction, I, I put, I mean, Ozzy's got a shot. Ozzy has got a shot, a legitimate shot, but I also feel like it might depend on who you ask. Cause I think there is definitely some people there who want them and maybe there isn't some people that don't want them. So, um, but here we are, he hasn't been eliminated yet as far as I can tell. And his name is still out there and it's Ozzy Guillen. So, um, that's my prediction. Can he still do the post game show as manager? Oh, man, that would be amazing. Can you imagine the television? Uh, Just, like, strolls onto the set in cleats. Like, Yeah, we'd have to have the set at the park. That would be incredible. Uh, believe me, if Ozzy becomes the manager, I've already thought about how, how, uh, how I'm going to cover that, and uh, that would be fascinating, uh, and how I would incorporate Ozzy uh, into uh, the world of NBC Sports Chicago. So, uh, But we'll just see what happens. Um I actually wrote this this idea down that if I was to make a baseball analogy as to my prediction, I would say that right now, and this is without me really knowing everything that's going on, but I'm just going to throw it out there. Ozzy's in the lead right now for the managing job. It's the bottom of the ninth inning. Liam Hendricks pitched yesterday, and he might have actually pitched the day before. And they're bringing him in. <laughs> how how is this going to play out? What what does Liam Hendricks have in his arsenal on this day? Will he close out the game and Ozzie Guillen becomes a manager, or will the opposite occur? And maybe, just maybe, Grafal becomes, or you know, some other candidate is the winner. That's kind of how I'm looking at it. This is going to be a game right now because it just feels now we are out. Obviously, we are in the middle of a um, a World Series feels where like a lot to put on Liam. I know I'm putting the whole thing on Liam. <laughs> it's all just right on your the arm. Flexor strain, man. I know, I know. I know. <laughs> Maybe not the right year to be saying this, but anyway, um, I, I guess my feeling is this, and I'm 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 saying this just also because of what happened on Sunday. Because that was the one day during the World Series you could announce if you had a manager in place, and the Royals did it with Quartaro. How do you say his name? Quartaro? Quartaro? How do you say his name? I'm asking you again. We'll get it at some point in the next three years. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, the bench coach of the Rays. And the White Sox didn't do it. So that led me to believe, and leads me to believe, they don't have their answer just yet. So maybe by Thursday, that's when the World Series ends. Uh, or potentially could end, um, or no, not the end. That would be when the next day off is. Um, they could right. uh, they could announce something then, or they could get rained out tonight, and then oh. there is no day off, and then we're stuck waiting all week. Okay, and then there's the other thing, which is this, everybody. We all say you have to wait till the World Series. Yeah, you have to wait for the World World Series to end for a team to announce it. But James Fegan, if you were to find out who was the manager of the White Sox, you wouldn't wait till after the World Series to report it, would you? I would not. See, see, so uh, I'm not going to sleep for the next few days because <laughs> it could happen at any moment. 
That's 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 why I haven't shaved. Yes, yes. I, I heard the sigh. I heard you sigh. You're like, <sighs> I know what's going on in, deep inside your soul. I know what it's like to be a beat writer. I mean, I've never been one, but I know I know what you guys are up to. And it's, uh, you, it's you look at the emotional weight that we walk. Yes, around with I do. I do. I and I admire it. I respect it. I believe me, I do. So I get it. Uh, this, uh, you, you've been great. Uh, one one last question. Jose Abreu, is he back or not? It just seems like he's he's not going to be back. As sad as it is, as much as it's like, you know, an offense that struggled not bringing back arguably its best hitter. Um, I think Hello is better on rate stat, but, you know, part of the thing without Abreu is that he plays all year. Um, you know, it's, it's a very hard thing to cope with, but it's also like this, they've talked about trying to get more flexible uh defensively and you know moving these guys out of uh, the outfield corners that they don't really necessarily belong to long term like Andrew Vaughn so yeah it seems like things are pointing to him not being back um you know it always can change and he's obviously got a lot of ownership support so there could be a kind of executive decision that turns it around but right now I'm, I'm expecting him to not be back which you know it, it's kind of a sad ending for a guy who put a lot in the franchise and, and want to be around for when it reached the mountaintop. Yeah. But that, that's what it looks like right now. All right. Well, we uh, will see where this all ends up. And um, this was great. Thank I kept you longer than I, I, I asked you for. So uh, James Fagan, I appreciate it. Uh, definitely read James work on the athletic at the athletic in the athletic. I'm not sure what the right word is there, but uh, he is a master of words and um, it's, it's great stuff. And it'll make you smarter. It'll make you a smarter White Sox fan reading James Fegan, that is for sure. Uh, thanks for coming on. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right. That's a wrap for this edition of the White Sox Talk Podcast, brought to you by Wintrust, your home for White Sox check-in with free ATMs nationwide. Go to their special White Sox webpage, www.wintrust.com slash Sox. Hawk Harrelson, it's all yours. Thanks, our Chuck. And this edition of the White Sox Talk Podcast is over.